Thank you. <coughs> Far from Lisa. Um, now, the next poet who's going to perform here tonight, um, I came across at uh, the launch of the winter edition of Poetry Review, which was held in the lovely surroundings of Keats House back in January. Um, an evening even more dismal than this one, and, uh, but a wonderful evening for poetry. And so um, I'd like to introduce Richard Scott. He studied poetry um, at the Faber Academy. He went on to win the Wasafara New Writing Prize. He was selected as a Jerwood Arvon Poetry mentee, and his poetry has been published twice in Poetry Review, twice in Poetry London. But this is his first time at Dodo Modern Poets. Give a big Dodo welcome to Richard. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Patrick. It's really nice to be here. Um, so I'll start with a few poems about my childhood. Hooray! Hey. <laughs> uh, so when I was younger, I went to school with a lad called Ian, and he used to do uh, weird things for money. And rather, <laughs> yeah. uh, and rather than discourage this, we'd all save up our pocket money to make him do even weirder and grosser things. Um, Everyone thought he was pretty awful, but I thought he was really cool. My stag. Under corrugated awning, Ian Tavner, for a 50p bet, peeled and jointed a stag beetle with his red penknife, ripping off all eight agate legs, ferreting out the fold-up Tiffany lamp wings, Beheading the stag with a butcher's confidence. When the dead beetle was laid out like a disassembled carburetor, winking blue black in the schoolyard sun, to complete the bet, Ian chased each body part down with a swig of cherry cola. <laughs> Our gang left grossed out, but I had the stomach for it. I was in love. I wiped his pink mouth with my Airtex sleeve, proudly gripped his surgeon's hand beneath the battered lunch bench, desperate for his kiss. Uh, this next poem I, I never read because the last time I did, someone kind of laughed all the way through out of embarrassment, I think. Or maybe I'm really good at writing comedy, but I, I don't think so. Um, uh, but anyway, when I was about 11, I had a really awful operation. Um, it was kind of a really late circumcision. Um, so obviously I decided to write a poem about it. Uh, um, uh, but it's really, uh, it's really kind of an apology to my dad, because uh, after I'd had this incredibly awful operation, I had to apply ointment to the wound, and obviously being a coward, who didn't like anything that hurt, I refused to, and my poor dad had to do it. <laughs> so, um, anyway, Daddy. In the car home, I ask if my foreskin's been kept by the surgeon, pickled perhaps in a specimen jar. You say he has almost certainly burnt it. We are bringing home a cream dangerous as glass to apply to my newborn skin just above the cavernous branch, but I stall before the bath intended to soften the wound, so your hand takes over. I guess you really loved me, pulling back, revealing something like what hides in a shell, soft, unused to air. Your palm sticks to my gluey cut. I cry out for mum, but you slap my thigh, afraid I won't heal if the cream isn't applied. And I'm terrified my dick will tear. The tiny black stitches like bugs bedding down for a feed on my prick, and it stinks. For months, I forewent rubbing that not quite named yet private pleasure, afraid I would rip. Worried the surgeon had named a fault line, all was at risk, ready to split. But eventually I had to. So I thought of the surgeon, his kind face, his moustache, how he touched me with his fingers, then his sterilised equipment, and then you, Dad, lotioning my scab. The wound 
wind stung as I tugged. Uh, lighter topics now. Um, <laughs> well, I'm not sure how light. Um, but um, another poem from my childhood. And um, <clears throat> this is really, I guess, about the power of words. And it's a poem about coming out before you actually come out. And uh, when I was younger, I used to take long walks and I'd shout, I'm gay, at the sea, kind of rehearsing it before I shouted it, or rather said it to my parents. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, it's a poem that uh, borrows almost the first line of a Seamus Heaney poem, uh, his poem Personal Helicon, which is dedicated to Michael Longley. And the first line of that poem is, uh, as a child, they could not keep me from wells. Uh, so I've kind of almost borrowed that line. Uh, and the poem borrows an epigraph from uh, Tony Kushner's play, Angels in America, mm -hmm. which is, Do homos take, like, lots of long walks? And the title really should be shouted. I'm gay! Mm -hmm. As a child, they could not keep me from the goat path, scarring the headline like an exposed vein of treacle. I'd canter skywards, half stumbling on roots, breathless for the edge where tough grass met jagged, wind-bitten stone. I'd gulp the hard air like breast milk and scream a secret to the laughing gulls as the rusted edge of the earth bore punches from a furious grey sheet of steel. A monk had died here. The butcher saw him jump, watched him pace this same marsh spray minutes before. Did he step out of his cassock, fold it for the fall? Entire mornings I'd wasted trying to find his sandal, wondering what secret brought him up here, his view a glass floor for the briefest of seconds, picturing his page-white torso winking in the glare a smattering of tawny hair encircling each rose-like nipple. Mom said, even dogs know to, know to stay away from cliff tops. <laughs> but I needed this blur of boundary, this rumble of the headland, its tidal shock avalanching back and forth like the war hammer of some furious Cornish god. Unlike humans, they held nothing back from each other. <coughs> The rust-coloured granite gave itself so completely to the sea that I could return home normal and spent, cut my jacket potato, inhale its buttery scent as my mother towel-dried my hair in silence. Um, I write a lot of narrative poems, so this next poem kind of plays around a bit uh, with the idea of a narrative. And um, it really talks um, a bit about, um, well, I guess if, you, if you're a, a queer poet, or whatever that means, I guess if you're trying to write about, um, you know, uh, being gay, then part of it is writing about how proud you feel, but also some of the shame you can feel. Um, and this is really about me being in the park, in Finsbury Park, and I'm trying to play with a friend and her daughter. But over in the other corner of the park, I can see that there are some guys hanging around the public toilets, and I really wish I didn't know what they were doing, because I'm trying to... You know, have a kind of family life over here, but sometimes, yeah, you know, your knowledge can betray you, so. Sandcastles. A tall gent waits inside the playground, not looking at any one child, but rather, mostly, at the dog-dark door of the public labs and the shadows pooling within. I wish I could enjoy forging sandcastles with you and your two-year-old, filling the lime green bucket, packing it down with a luminous shovel. Only now this man is watching me. He's caught me amongst the families, caught me trying to play daddy. His gaze is iron heavy as he walks to the lavatory door, pauses like he were crossing a road, then enters. In one version of the poem, <coughs> follow him in, slide up next to the cistern. He bolts the grimy cubicle door behind us, unzips my jeans. In another, I stay building with your daughter, 
affecting the castle's keep, the last place to be breached in a siege. In another, I'm disgusted by these queers who hang around toilets trying to catch my eyes. In another, I am your husband. I yearn to leave our daughter alone for just a handful of minutes. She'd be fine out here, knowing there is more love for me in there with him. In the last version, I am your daughter, sculpting the intricate castle from damp sand, pitted through with fag ends and gum, oblivious to the men, the poem being written. <laughs> Uh, so my final poem in this half, I believe, um, and um, uh, and uh, you don't really need to know very much at all, except for that I was mugged once in Catford, um, and it's a really lovely place. Um, and, um, uh, it, it can be sometimes. Apologies if anyone lives in Catford. You know. um, uh, and the poem is called Batty Man, and it's the kind of thing that um, at some point most gay men probably will have had shouted to them in their lifetime. Uh, it's a pretty awful thing, really, to say. But also, it's kind of beautiful and childish, too, the phrase Batty Man, so I, I, I like it. Um, yeah, Batty Man. Tottering off the night bus, bumming fags off fit lads lotused on the curbstones, cans in hand. When this group of hoodies, all third generation, spy me in high tops and skinny jeans. Batty man! I leg it. Oi, bats, you is gonna get it! Fuck, I'm sweating. Come here, queer! All ten of them surround me like a pride at the watering hole. They steer me into an alley, shove me onto my back, hands rifling through my pockets like tongues into crevices. Stay down, fag, or he'll shank you. One of them, not unhandsome, wipes a kitchen knife on my neck, so close I can smell its steel breath as it tugs on my stubble. Pin, I don't remember. Pin, or you're dead, boy. Nine, seven, one, uh, zero. They leg it. Save one, puffing on a joint making sure I don't call the police till they are safely pocketed away into the red brick estates of Catford. Toke? Please. I suck on his reefer tasting dust, my dad's tweed jacket, hedgerows on the common growing after rain, my boyfriend's hungover breath, the damp alleyway. You queer? No, I lie good, because they would have killed you. He slaps me across the jaw, keeps his paw there, moves in, then kisses me. The pink insides of his mouth, the only warm thing in the alley. His hands in my hair now, the other on my back, his skunk breath, his chapped bottom lip, Velcro in mine. Then he's off. Later's boy. Stay here for a while, yeah? Finish my split. Very powerful first set there from Richard, so uh, more applause please for Richard Scott. Okay, our next poet, uh, Pauline Seward, has been here at Dodo Modern Pies before, and like Richard, she's got a bit of poetic.